Hello. Thank you so much for joining me today. So I'm Paula Carnell and this is my webinar, A Quest for Bees in Bhutan. I was really inspired to have a trip to Bhutan. So this is my talk, which coincides with the book, Bees in Bhutan. Here we go. And a lot of the photographs that I'll be sharing today are actually in this book. And I will be giving you a code that you can use if you want to order your own copy of this book that I will sign. Um, then you can enter the code and you'll get it postage free in the UK. And I do believe I might have quite a few people from Bhutan and I would love to be selling the book in Bhutan. So if any of you know a bookshop, I will happily ship a box of books to Bhutan if there's enough of you there who want to have your own copies of the books. And every copy of this book that is sold, one pound goes to the charity be um, opening your heart to Bhutan. And you'll hear a bit more about the charity and the founder of the charity during this talk. So thank you very much for joining me. And if you're live, I'm live on YouTube and Facebook. So comment in the comment boxes and then I'll know that you're here watching me and add your name if you haven't given permission so then I can see who it is that's here. That would be lovely. And then um, also, I'll be answering questions at the end, but I'll give you a, a little bit of information. If you're watching this on replay, then welcome, and I hope you enjoy enjoy the show. So here we go. So this is all about my beekeeping adventures in Bhutan. So if you're on Facebook, it would be really great if you can share it. So just go underneath where you can see me now and there'll be a share button and you just click share. Tag some friends if you think there's anybody who should be watching this, then it would be really great. The more the merrier. And add your questions and your insights or comments as we go in the chat box. You can just write them all in and then I will look at them at the end. And I've got some wonderful people here in the background who are just, um, you know, helping me with any tech issues. So just be be patient and I hope you enjoy this show. So Bhutan. Why would anybody want to go and visit there? And where is Bhutan? These are the questions I often get asked. And um, Bhutan is actually positioned in the Himalayas. So it's between Nepal, India and China. And lots of people travel to Nepal and they go trekking in the mountains. And obviously India is also uh, got some amazing Himalayan um, places that you can visit and you can trek. But Bhutan is a private kingdom and it's been it was shut to the public until the 1980s and first visitors were in the 1960s and they tended to be invited guests. So it's not somewhere that a lot of people go to. There's about 8000 tourists a year. And when you go, you do pay a tax. However, the tax includes your guides, a driver and your accommodation. And so you are completely cared for the whole time that you're traveling. Um, so you'll learn a bit more about that. The thing that really attracted me to Bhutan is that it's organic. They don't use any chemicals. It is a kingdom. And the king has um, ensured that the country is being maintained as a, as a nature reserve. And it's the only carbon positive country in the world. So all the damage that we're doing, Bhutan is offsetting it for us. So it has 75% of its land masses covered in forest, the most beautiful trees, ancient, ancient trees and forests that you've ever seen. And, um, and all the agriculture, is organic. They don't spray anything. So I knew that that was going to be good for bees. It's also a Buddhist country. And so the majority of the population are Buddhist, which means they're vegetarian and they don't want to do any harm to the to the, their land. So they're very aware of all the things that I'm always lecturing about, about looking after our, our country and looking after our land. And so they're a very gentle people. It's also known of as being the happiest place on the planet. And what they do, they have an elected democratic government as well as their king, and they 
ensure that every big decision for the country, every policy is based on gross national happiness, not like our GDP or gross domestic product. So when they have to make changes or develop anything, it all depends on how that's going to affect the happiness of the country. And this isn't just a sort of a random thing. They have books, they have research, they study this. So the whole population has its happiness measured. And what I did find very interesting is that the least happy people in the country are women my age in their 50s who live in rural areas. So they haven't had access to um, education, perhaps they haven't had all the opportunities that I've had. And of course, now that they have 50 year old Western women coming and we obviously all look very happy and successful, then they they just you know, they're, they're missing it. It makes them feel sad. So as a tourist, you have quite a responsibility whenever you visit anywhere to really understand with compassion about the country and what it is you're bringing to the country. So although I love traveling, I always like to leave a positive impact and I like to learn as much as I can about the country so that I can do whatever I can do to help. So this country was shut off from the rest of the world um, until 1998 when um, satellite television and telephones were brought into the country. So almost overnight they went from being completely isolated to having access to everything that we have access to. So you have these rural farm women who've never been to school suddenly able to watch Desperate Housewives or Neighbours and so they're having a different impression of the West and there's Bhutan is a really complex country and the whole Buddhism is just an incredible religion and and it's a way of life and it's there's way too much that I could talk about just in this this talk but in my book, I go into it in a little bit more detail. And of course, the bees. So the bees were the main draw for me. Although I was turning 50 and after my 40s being spent mainly in bed and disabled, um, it was really important to me that I spent my 50s on top of the world because I felt like I was on top of the world. I was I'd started my business working with bees. Um, I was working, I was earning money, and I wanted to do something really special for my 50th. It is quite an expensive trip, so I went on my own. I couldn't bring my family, but actually I thought, well, then I can be doing more work and I can focus it all on what I want to do and not just doing all the normal tourist sites that my family would want to do. However, since being there, I really want to return with my family. So the two photographs here, the one on the left is when I flew into Bhutan, from India, I went um, via Delhi, and there's actually Mount Everest. So it was the most spectacular view, flying across the Himalayas and then looking out the window to see Mount Everest. And I was so lucky to have a window seat and able to see the highest mountain in the world. And then the photograph on the right is just as we're coming into Paro Valley. And Paro, my husband was a bit nervous. He's been in aviation for years. And so he's very aware of the risks every time a plane takes off and lands. And we did learn that Paro Airport is the scariest. It is officially the scariest airport in the world and um, quite possibly quite dangerous. And so there's only... Um, eight pilots who are qualified and licensed to actually land into that airport. So it was quite scary, but it was a beautiful, clear day. And I was so excited. And all of us on the plane were excited as we went flying down into the into the country. So the next slide, this is the the map of Bhutan. So I hope you can see this. I'm going to show with my little pointer here. So Paro Airport is here. And you actually travel all the way across the country. There's one main road that goes all the way across. And I went to Bumthang, which was around there. And then I traveled back. So I flew across the country. Then I traveled back to Tromsø and then flew back to Paro, went to Timpu, then went to... Um, more into the central area there on our way to drive down to Sarang down. So there's Punaka up there and then we drove all the way down and then back and then back to Paro. So it really was quite an adventure. And there's so much more to see in Bhutan. So there's plenty more you can see. I, I mainly focused around some main roads 
Um, but there's plenty I would like to see, and you can do treks all around the country. But there is just this one main road that goes through the centre of the country and goes to the far, far east over there. So, so the day after I arrived, um, or the day I arrived, we landed in Paro Airport, and you can just see the Zong, the white building. So the Zong, spelled D Z O N G, are the big temples, and they tend to be the government or minister council buildings as well as the main monastery. So because Bhutan is a very spiritual country and and Buddhist. Um, the, their religion and the government is all very much intertwined. So as we got off the plane, instead of what you would expect from an airport, we were very relaxed and walking around taking pictures because we were in this incredible set with surrounded by mountains and a beautiful clear sky. And we were at about 3000 meters. And the airport has these wonderful big murals, all beautiful painted buildings. And there was a painting there of the king and queen and their son. And they've since had another baby. So that's very exciting. So I'm sure the painting's been updated. And then the picture on the right there, that shows the view from my hotel. So my guides met me from the airport, took me to the hotel. And I have a wonderful travel agent called Maria, Maria Foxwell. And she knew how important this trip was for me. But because I was busy working, I wasn't able to put the time needed to plan it. So she made sure that I had a hotel room and I could look out the window from my bedroom and see the Tiger's Nest Monastery. And you'll see a, another picture of that later on. And so it was just so magical to arrive in this country, get to my hotel room and look out the window and I could see the most famous monastery in the world. And then above it, you can see higher mountains. So the monastery, it was just had the light on it there. And at the end of my trip, I actually did a trek from this mountain and then all the way across the top, camped up on the top and then walked down to the monastery. And then you walk down again to the base. So it was a wonderful way to tie the whole trip together. So I started here looking at the um, tiger's nest and then I ended actually visiting it. So the next morning was my first internal flight. So on this little plane, I was terrified I wasn't going to get a window seat. I'd been nagging everyone. I was thinking, right, I really want to have a window seat because I've got to see this view as we fly across the Himalayas. Now my flight into Paro, although it's meant to be scary, was actually beautiful it was stunning and I wasn't scared at all this flight it was a bit of a cloudy day and the flights are very hit and miss they get cancelled just like that because the weather is is very unpredictable in the Himalayas and you are very high up um, but I hadn't needn't have worried about not getting a window seat because they only half fill the plane because they have to restrict the weight so that it can maneuver through the mountains and it was a really cloudy day. So we left in sunshine, we went through some heavy cloud and how on earth the pilot knew to get in between the mountains. And then suddenly you go through the clouds and then we landed at Bumthang. And this amazingly is where the beekeeping cooperative is based. But this is the airport terminal, wonderful little building. So that's the airport that you arrive, you land sort of next to field. So all our guides were waiting for us on the field. There was only 18 on the plane and our bags fitted on the trailer on the back of the tractor and they're pulled off. And these were my two guides. So I had one Chuck on the left, who I hope is watching. It'd be wonderful um, if he's actually there. Um, I'd really like to, you know, to say hello to one Chuck. So hello, hello, hello. And it's wonderful that we've kept in touch. And um, so do put a comment, one Chuck, if you're there, just let us all know that you're here watching. So it's one Chuck, young chap on the left, and then Sonam on the right was our driver. And I was everybody's mum for for my time there which was was really exciting so Sonam interestingly used to be a monk and one of the things that had got me so interested in going to Bhutan was I've been researching the spiritual connection between humans and bees and traveling to um, Oman and I was working with um, Omani beekeepers and I could see how their um, their religion, Islam, was being carried forward and, and working with their bees. And it had an impact. The bees were well, they were sharing their honey. And, you know, I was really excited about this. And 
as I researched other religions, there's quotations about bees in in the Bible, um, the Jews, you know, in the um, you know so many different religious texts. There's all these references to the the importance of bees and their spiritual connection. And yet Buddhism, I couldn't find anything written about. So I was really excited about traveling to Bhutan and finding out that perhaps the Buddhists would also believe that honey is a magical medicine and that, you know, we, we need to treasure the bees. So I was really shocked that when Sonam and, and Wang Chuck got me in the car and we got chatting and when I realized that Sonam was a former monk, after the first question of why aren't you a monk anymore? And he's he left the monkhood and, and is now married with a family. And um, I then said, so what do monks believe about honey? And he said, we believe that taking honey is a sin. And I was just completely stunned. And I said, why? How could it possibly be a sin? And he said, well, because the Buddha um, was given a single drop of honey on his tongue and he was then punished for a hundred years. But I couldn't quite figure out why he was punished or why it was a sin. And it wasn't until later on when I came to write my book and I reread all my notes that I'd been taking and having had chats with Wonchuk after my return that I then discovered that um, it was that it, it's even more complex than we thought. So I had a lot to learn. And the other funny thing about Sonam was I said, gosh, what do the monk, how do the other monks treat you? Now you're no longer a monk. What do they believe about monks who, who stop being monks? And he said, they just believe that you will have more challenges in life. So that was another giggle for us that actually I was Sonam's challenge in this life with trying to help me on my quest for bees across Bhutan. So let me just get the next picture up. Now for some reason, I can't quite get the next, oh, there we go. So when we got to Bumthang, I was driven to the hotel and we actually passed the um, beekeeping cooperative. So that was incredible that I was again booked by Maria to be so close to such an important place. And these are some of the hives. So after dropping my bags off, we came back and stopped and had a look at these beehives and I got to see my first bees in Bhutan. Now, before I traveled there, I had read an article by Natalie Bradbeer, actually a research project that she had done in the 1980s on following a visit to Bhutan. And she had said that there was Apis serrana, which is the Asian honeybee. There was Apis dorsata, which is the giant Asian bee, and Apis laboriosa, which is also a giant honeybee. And, um, and then the stingless bees, which are in the south of the country. And there was talk about Apis florea, which is a bee that you, well, that I had seen over in Oman. So it's a Middle Eastern bee. And there was some Apis florea around. But there was no mention of Apis mellifera, which is the European honeybee. So I was looking at these bees thinking they wouldn't be Apis mellifera. And I hadn't seen Apis serrana before. So I was looking at them thinking, gosh, they look just like Apis mellifera. And I then met these beekeepers so Naveen and Pretty, who may also be watching so I hope if you are you will just say hello in the comments and Naveen and Pretty had a beekeeping business and a chicken business chicken farm right next to my hotel so I got to meet them and taste their honey and I had a wonderful time learning about the bees and what they do for beekeeping and what really shocked me was they told me that actually they have Apis mellifera and the Apis mellifera were imported into Bhutan about um, 30 years ago. So not long after Natalie had visited. So Naveen and Pretty have Apis mellifera bees and there were five colonies brought in in the late eighties. And now there's around a thousand colonies that have been spread across central and, and towards the north of Bhutan. So they have their honey business and he had some incredible honeys, which I've brought back. So here's some of his hives. And what I love as well is they, they have, it seems they almost look Bhutanese because they have, although it's, it's um, a standard box that you'd see all over the world for bees, 
it has um, a sheet over the top and then these big boulders that have been carried up from the river, um, beautiful river that runs in the distance there behind the greenhouses or the polytunnels and there's all these bees. Um, and so we opened up a hive and he was showing me some of the bees and then we had some tasting of some of his honey. So I've still got it, it traveled traveled well and when I do my talks to groups I actually pass around some honey and we all get to have a taste. So he is experimenting with single variety honeys and um, and so this is one of the ones I've got and this one was actually buckwheat honey. Now it was wonderful for me to have buckwheat honey and to learn that buckwheat is what was used more than wheat in Bhutan. So as I am wheat intolerant, it was great because I could eat the bread, I could eat the pastas, they were making things that I could eat. So I'm just gonna have a little taste of this. So this is granulated and it's um, his buckwheat honey. Mm. Oh, and I see we've got Frank here from um, Chicago who's joined, so hello Frank. And thank you very much for your for being such a fan, top fan. So amazing honey. And gosh, you have this great prolonged flavor. So although this is crystallized, which means that it is set, it's just very complex. And I tried all sorts of honeys from there. And he, um, we had a wonderful t session tasting the different honeys. So you can see in the picture I showed, there's these, jars where he'd been writing the the names of them on there and he's trying to develop these individual honeys and just before our current situation I had placed an order with him because I really want to have some of his honeys to sell to people here in the UK um, in my honey subscription boxes but sadly all our borders were locked down and so it wasn't possible for me to have some of his honey but as soon as I do I will let you know and then um we can then have some Bhutanese honey and you can taste some of the wonderful organic buckwheat and the fresh air, the clean fresh air of Bhutan here in the UK. And hello, Debbie. So wonderful. Glad you're here. Thank you. So um, Naveen, he introduced us to this amazing chap called Kabiraj. And Kabiraj is um, the head of the organization of the boot and um, the Bumthang beekeeping cooperative and what he does is he's from southern bhutan and he is is not buddhist but he actually has honeys from all different types of bees so down in the south he has a house and so he has apis serrano and he was able to give us an incredible tasting of different types of honeys and the small jar he's got there is one that he actually gave me, which was high altitude honey. And this is from the, um, the mountains near Bumthang, where he has the bees at 4,000 meters. Now this is Apis mellifera at 4,000 meters, which is just not really heard of. So the bees have been there for 30 years and they've just adapted and they're now high up in the mountains. And this one is incredible. Now you can see, perhaps you can see the color, very yellow color, bright orangey yellow. And this is clover, a bit of rhododendron. Um, mm. Again, very unusual, quite citrusy, but you just taste, you can just taste Bhutan. And I just want to I wish I was back up there on those mountains tasting the honey. And he was so kind and generous. And this is the thing about Bhutanese is um, we were invited into the house and we could meet the family. And his wife was cooking for us, cooked a meal. They insisted that we stay for lunch. And the big pot you can see in the middle of the table is butter. So they have butter with everything and rice with everything. So big pots of rice and there's a huge steamer behind it. And that was the rice. And then his wife had made some amazing dishes that we could share. And this was the first time I had their traditional dish, which is chilies and cheese. And all across Bumthang, people have grown their chilies and they dry them on the roofs of their houses. 
and they eat the chilies, really, really hot chilies, and they have this melted cheese with them. And um, it really is a hot dish. So most of the tourists in the hotels, they're not given this dish at all. And we have quite bland food because they know we can't cope with the, the chili. So it made everybody laugh when I tried that. And I found after that, I was able to eat more of the more traditional Bhutanese food and I can cope with the, the chilies. So we were there for several hours and I learned so much about the bees, about the stingless bees in the south, about the rock bees. He told us where to find the different colonies. And he also put me in touch with um, the government officials that he works with who are on this program to try and help beekeepers in Bhutan. So these are some of the pots. Now, the rock bee, that plastic bottle is what they have a, a brandy in. And they call it rock bee because they sweeten it with honey from the wild bees. So these are the ones that hang off on the rock sides. And you might have seen um, wildlife programs where you have people climbing up these rickety ladders, not wearing a full bee suit. And they're cutting away this big sheet of honeycomb and taking the honey. Now, this used to be quite um, a quite a spiritual practice so you'd have a village and you'd have a honey hunter from the village and they would go and take the honey only once a year maybe twice a year special occasions and the whole village would be involved but now with tourism um, it can be done a bit too often and so the bees are at risk and in Bhutan it's illegal to do this but around the borders so in Nepal and in India they still do take the honey and um, and they make the brandy so they call these bees the rock bees and he had a whole mixture of different honeys. And we had these big bowls and he was dishing out the honey for all of us. And I knew that poor Sonam shouldn't be eating any honey because if single drop would have a hundred years of, of punishment and Sonam was being so brave and eating bowl after bowl of honey. So I felt so bad for him, but he learned a lot about bees um, as the, the weeks progressed. So this is our, our food and you can see how bright red the chilies are. Um, with the cheese and a huge bowl of rice. So it was just wonderful to eat with a family and for them to share what little they have. They were just so welcoming and invited me into their home. And that was really, really special. And this was his beautiful home. What I also love about Bhutan is the work for artists. Artists are um, painting all around the, the country. They paint these beautiful murals on the houses. And there's plenty of stories about the different types of murals, but I won't go into them now. But in my book, there's a great story about um, the madman, the divine madman and the symbol that gets painted over a lot of the buildings in Bhutan. So this is a view of a standard apiary. So this was um, Kabiraj's apiary, one of his many apiaries with all his bees lined up and all getting prepared for the winter months. So they reduce the hives down so that the bees can survive the winter. And while I was waiting for a meeting with the government officials, so Kabi Raj had introduced me to, um, to them, given me the phone number. And what I love about Bhutan is because it's such a small country with only about 700,000 in population, almost everyone is related or knows each other. So if you want to see anybody, you just have to ask someone and they make a couple of phone calls and they can connect you which is just magical, magical networking. Now, this is a wonderful lady called Pema. And I met her through a dear friend of mine called Julie, who is a traveler and an artist and who had traveled to Bhutan twice, I think, before I went. And so she had shared some of her paintings, which had really inspired me and had got me excited about going to Bhutan. And on Facebook, when she would talk about her work, um, there would be this lovely Pema who would also comment. So Pema and I started to be friends on Facebook and chat to each other. And when I was visiting Bhutan, I said, I'm going to come to Bumthang, where I believe you live. So can we meet up? And it was wonderful. And we did meet up. And we had such a fabulous, fabulous evening. She came and met me at the hotel and took me to a little restaurant and we sat and ate and we had so much in common. Um, we're both um, married second time. We're both step mums and we're mothers and we're, um, we're business people. And what was amazing was she was telling me about her incredible work that she does for charities. So she supports women who have been abused and she supports them by making crafts and they make these beautiful scarves and bags. 
but she's under no illusion. She knows that in Bhutan overall, they're very lucky and the kind of abuse there is is not on the same level that you can see in other parts of the world. However, it is still abuse. And so she's helping to empower women to stand up for what they believe is right and what is fair and enable them to have an income and to create a business. Because as the world is changing, women are also needing to have an income to improve their lives for their families. And so she had these beautiful scarves and bags and she works with the queen, um, one of the queen mothers of Bhutan as well. So we had a fabulous time and I felt so honoured to meet her. And when you walk around Bhutan, you have these great, you have the prayer wheels everywhere, which are very, very um, magical and you, you just have to be spinning them. And then I love these little messages on rubbish bins to try and keep the country tidy is the use me and, um, and this wonderful character that came through in the English that they use. So although they're speaking um, in Drongsa, they're their traditional language most people do speak English though they get a bit shy they're a bit nervous just like I'm shy of speaking French my schoolgirl French is not to be shared so and there we have some bees as well on the marigold so as I was looking around temples you would see bees just all over the place and then just along um, the main river in Bumthang we came across Wong Chuck and I were walking along and um, this bee just came out of nowhere and was buzzing around my hair. And of course, I've not got good bee hair. You know, it's easy for bees to get caught. And it was huge and it sounded like a hornet. So I was a bit jumpy and Wong Chuck managed to free it. And then we found it. there was a Apis laboriosa. So the giant Asian honeybee hive. And it's just a wild nest in the side of the rocks on the side of the road. And they make their comb. They have this huge comb and they sit on the comb and they actually migrate. So they travel north and south around the country, depending on the time of year. And so these bees are the ones that you also see in some of the nature documentaries where they sort of quiver. They do a kind of Mexican wave. And that's the way that they protect themselves from predators. So a really loud buzz and a close encounter with my first rock bees. And then we went and saw my favourite temple and it was called Kazundrak and it was just outside Bumthang and you go past a place called the Burning Lake which is um, a, a wonderful sacred site and then up to this temple and all the temples in Bhutan are built by angels and they're built without nails and they're also hanging from the sides of cliffs at very high altitudes. So I'm stood on the decking. You could walk around the temple and spin the prayer wheels. And this was one of my most magical, magical times in Bhutan because we went up there with a, um, a small picnic with a, a flask of tea and we were the only ones at the temple and we were sat in the temple and Sonam and Wanchuk had allowed for me to have time to meditate. So we sat in this temple for an age and it was it was just so, so special. The silence of being really high up in these very special places on big ancient wooden floorboards that are not held up with any nails. And we were sat there meditating and we could hear some chanting and some bells. So I have my own little Bhutanese bells. And there was actually a um, Lama on pilgrimage with his group of followers and they were coming up the mountain and they actually came into the temple with us. So while we were sat there, they actually all came in and they were chanting, which was just so special to be part of it. And then the resident monk, actually helped um, opened up some of the treasures. So we got to view some treasures and we went to look up into a higher temple as well. So it was one of those life changing moments was to actually go and and be in such a spiritual place amongst spiritual people. There were no other tourists. It was just it was just me. And I do write about this in a lot more detail in the book because it, it was quite special. And when we walked back down, we had a moment um, as well with just fabulous views fabulous views clean air and the other thing is because there's so little flights in Bhutan that you don't hear planes very often so I think it's two or three days a week that planes come in and go so the skies are completely clear and you might get helicopters flying over for mountain rescue but 
other than that, the, the skies are only filled with birds. So you just hear birdsong. And it's only when you're away from sounds that we've become so familiar with that you realise the um, the peace, you know, just how peace and tranquil the, tranquil the planet can be. And actually, many of us have noticed it during the last few months where there have been fewer planes. So really, really special. And so um, as we were coming down from the mountain, we also saw some beekeepers and we saw some hives that were wrapped in blankets to keep them warm as the winter was approaching. So I was there in November and we would have up to sort of 20, 25 degrees in the daytime. And then it would be absolutely freezing at night. It would be minus 10. So you need to be dressed in good autumnal clothes, lots of layers. And we stopped as we were driving back and we saw these beekeepers who, again, were reducing the sizes of their hives ready for the winter months and um, and just protecting them. So they'd all done their harvest. So the, the autumn harvest was done. And then we had our picnic. We had so many picnics and Solomon and Wanchuk were wonderful um, with these great mixture of Bhutanese food. And they ensured that I didn't have too many chilies and we would sit outside um, sometimes in the sunshine, but once the sun went behind the mountains, it got cold very, very quickly. But so many beautiful forests, ancient forests. And in Bhutan, the king on his birthday um, has the whole country planting trees. So 700,000 trees are planted every year in Bhutan. And it's really important that they, um, it's the basis of everything there, that they maintain their natural balance. So they always have at least 65% of the country covered in trees, but it is currently 75%. So if you miss woodlands that's and forests, this is a place to visit. And this is the kind of food that I would have in the evenings. So um, I'd be sat in the hotel and um, it was really quite quiet and most people would travel through they wouldn't be spending um several days in one hotel so i was quite unusual because i had seven nights in Bumthang. so here we are with the map and we planned wong chuck was very good because he realized that i wanted to see bees and it was very difficult in the uk to plan where these beekeepers were so Bumthang is here jackar and we'd gone up to um my favorite temple kazundrak gumpa up there and he told me about ura where there were beekeepers and there were rock bees and then also going back along this main road you can just see how wiggly it is was Trongsa where Wonchuk's family lived and was the ancient capital. So we were going to go back and visit there. So Wonchuk worked really hard at trying to plan a good itinerary for me to meet beekeepers. And so we took this drive to Ura. And as we were driving along this wonderful river, river bank or river, he spotted bees. So one shot became better than me at spotting bees. And he was forever saying, look, there's some bees, here's some bees. And these are the rock bees high up in the mountains. Now, these were empty comb. So you would see it's very difficult to see them clearly, but they were just bits of wax comb hanging from various parts on the rocks. And in the summer, you they would be covered in bees. And then in the winter, the bees fly south for warmer climes. And then when we went to Ura, we walked around this beautiful ancient village and there were people weaving and ancient farmland. And this was a rug that I bought. And there were two sisters who lived together and they invited us in. So this is a traditional Bhutanese kitchen. And she put the kettle on and made us some amazing tea. And what they eat there as snacks is they have puffed rice they grow their own rice it's very much self um sufficient most much of the country people grow enough food for themselves and their family and um and they heat their rice so they make puffed rice and we had crackers and we had this milk um this milky tea which i thought i would drink it because i didn't want to take too much time up while we were visiting but every time i emptied the cup she would fill it so i ended up having three cups of this drink so i had to use her bathroom twice during my visit whereas one truck was very clever and sipped his slowly so he was able to only have have one cup but it was an incredible mixture of um of yak milk yak milk tea 
And here she is, then she brought out the strong stuff. So this is a really strong spirit and the kind of traditional um, flasks that they would carry the spirit in. So we then had to have a top up. So again, the hospitality was amazing. So the next day I had my appointment that Kabi Raj had helped organize. And this is with some of the ministers of the Bee Project in Bumthang. And this was wonderful. I was quite nervous about meeting them because it all happened rather quickly. And I wasn't quite sure what, well, that they would want to see me or what would come of it or what we could do to help. But I just remembered that if I just see, he, listen and just say, what can I do to help? It, you know, I could learn about what the problems are they're facing. And it was great because they told me so much about the bees. They told me how the bees came to be in Bhutan, about any issues they have with Apis mellifera and um, that they're trying to sell their honey. They're trying to find a way to let the world know about their honey. They're producing organic honey because they don't have all the chemicals in their farmland. But Bhutan is a very difficult country to get things in and out of. And because of the plane, you have weight limits. So it's very difficult in the global honey market because you cannot be selling big drums of honey um, because they just can't get them in or out. And so what I'm finding that my role is, is to try and connect really fine honey producers with people that want to buy and taste fine honeys. So if I can connect them around the world, so people in the Middle East may want Bhutanese honey or in Africa or in the UK, and it's connecting those buyers because what I don't want to see is these farmers in Bhutan producing honey at such a reduced rate that they can't earn a living. And by the time it goes to all the different hands, and if it's sold in big drums, there's no there's no profit. So what's the point? So what I want to be able to do is encourage them to be selling their honey in really fine packaging um, and beautiful honey so that we can get to taste the amazing honey. So that's one of the things I feel is my role. And this is the kind of pots that you can find, beautiful carved pots, boxes, with the Bhutanese honey, with the, the mark on there. So this is the kind of thing that I'd really like to help. Um, and that's the reason why I wrote the book, so that more people could learn about Bhutan. And if we're looking for healthy honey, because in the UK it's very difficult to have organic honey because we don't have the space that is un, or unsprayed with chemicals. So our bees are almost always being exposed to chemicals, which obviously gets brought into the hive and into the honey. Whereas in Bhutan, you just don't have that. So the air is pure, the water is pure, the land is pure. And so you have these incredible bees producing magical medicinal honey. So the other coincidence was having met Pema through Facebook and then we had our night out. It turned out that Pema's husband works in the Department of Agriculture in an adjacent office to um, the, the people from the Bee Project. So I then had a meeting with him and they had their son in with them, one of their sons in with them. Um, and so I had another great meeting with her and with her husband. And he is a nutritional expert for agriculture. So he advises farmers on the nutritional aspects of maintaining their livestock. So it was wonderful that you could have these people so close to each other. And I'm hoping that I could help connect them so they can work together and learn more about the nutrition for bees is so important and has an impact on us as well. And then these were some of the hives outside the, the ministerial buildings, which I believe were the Queen's hives that were put there for the winter. So very royal hives. Now then, as I mentioned earlier about how everybody knows everybody, I had been chatting to Wonchuk and Sonam about the fact that I'm studying herbal medicine. And Wonchuk said, well, I have a friend I was at school with and he is a traditional doctor, traditional medicine doctor in um, Bumthang. So he phoned him up and I got an appointment. And so we went round and got to meet Damcho, who I'm still in contact with, who is a very wise doctor and he uses traditional medicine. And this was great because then I got to learn more about the whole... Um, balance of health in Bhutan. Now the king wanted people to have access to western medicine so you have western medicine hospitals around Bhutan but each hospital also has a traditional medicine 
section. And so people have that choice that they can have the traditional medicine or they can have the Western medicine. And so Damcho is very, very busy um, treating patients. And he was telling me that he does use honey, but he needs to use the purest honey for some of his medicine because it's no good putting sugar in. He wants to give the pure honey. And what I love was this sign here of the mission in the hospitals about how they want to ensure that they have quality and um, and good health choices for the people of Bhutan. And there were these amazing menus of the different treatments you can have. And so acupuncture, and there was um, salt um, breathing, there was all kinds of magical treatments that you could have, but not so magical. They're traditional and they work and they've been used for thousands of years. And so Bhutan has this amazing health service and it would be really great to go back and um, learn more about that. So I was then in Bhutan and we were going to travel back to Trongsa. So this is where Wanchuk's family live and it was also the ancient capital and it was a very twisty long road so it's about three hours to do that journey and so um, Sonam drove us and this is a view of the road so it's just been cut into the mountain into the trees and it is very very twisty very very narrow and I can see now why you need a guide and a driver because there is no way your guide could be answering questions of oh what's this and what type of tree is that and what's that village below us when he's driving these roads so Sonam was able to keep his eyes on the roads and was always playing wonderful um, chants and and great Bhutanese music as we were driving through the mountains and when you get to Trongsa there is this beautiful zong so this is a big a monastery a temple and the council offices and it was a royal palace so it's this beautiful place and what's quite extraordinary is you get used to being in the Himalayas and thinking oh it's winter and it's cold and you just drop down in between the mountains and suddenly it's tropical and Trongsa had this real feel of um a Mediterranean town it was just such a fabulous place um so it was really good to actually be able to see this place that was full of um, amazing tropical flowers. And then we had all these um, beautiful um, wildlife. There was butterflies. There was all kinds of magical, magical things. So let me just see. I don't know quite why. Let me just have a fiddle here. For some reason, my screen, I've just got there. So do comment if you've been to Bhutan. I'd love to know if you've been there. Right, for some reason, I can't quite get my screen back. So do we have any other comments? So, yeah, do tell me if you've been to Bhutan. Right, I seem to be having a bit of a problem here where I can't get my slides. Let me just try again. Um, excuse me one minute. Right, here we go. I think we're back on. Here we go. So in Trongsa, you have these beautiful, beautiful temples and the red monk's robes are just stunning against the white. So anybody visiting can take hundreds of pictures just of the monks looking spectacular um, amongst the temple buildings. And what I was excited about, which ties in again with other work that I do with bees, is about the placement of bees and where bees choose to be. And we asked the monks here if they had any bees because it's well known that bees will hang off the sides of these temple buildings. And they told us that bees live up on this. Um, it's like a, a flagpole or a bell tower. And there was actually bees in there. But of course, it was on top of a roof and I couldn't get that close. So I wasn't able to um to sort of show you 
a close up of the bees, but we could see the bees buzzing there. And all these songs are placed, they're positioned following great meditations and a lot of thought. And they all have a very important reason for being where they are. So the whole Buddhist tradition or the, the um, Bhutanese Buddhist tradition tells a story of it's all dragons and um, battles and tigers and how you have the big giant demons and how this demon, demoness, an evil demoness was pinned to the ground uh, into the Himalayas and to sort of pin her ankles to the ground. Temples were built on, on those spots to sort of cleanse the evil. And so you have this idea of all across the Himalayas, there's these giant demons and at key points, so ankles and knees and wrists and head, they're pinned down with these very spiritual places. Now, I believe that bees are very spiritual. And so the fact that the bees would choose to live on these points is also very interesting. So here we go. There's some more giant bees on some of the, the flowers. And this is in the gardens. And then because Wonchuk's family were living there, we had to, well, we didn't have to pop in, but we did. And it was absolutely delightful to visit Wonchuk's family, his parents, his sister, and their farm just on the outskirts of Trongsa with an enviable view, stunning view, which surrounded by their farmland and they're self-sufficient farmers. So they produce all the food that they need for their family. And they were very kind and shared it with me. And we also had a tour of the house. Now, the other extraordinary thing in Bhutan is that the largest room in the house doesn't have a big television in it. It has a an altar and it's a temple. So in the cupboard there are all the, um, the prayer books. And then you actually have the altar, which is covered in gifts for various times of year there's there's um, different ceremonies and so gifts are given to the different um, gurus and um, the different forms of buddha and it was such a beautiful room such a stunning room with the light coming through now in um, bhutan in the temples you're not allowed to take photographs so i was really honored that they let me take these pictures of this amazing room um, and that is the focal point of their family so when somebody passes or when there's a big celebration a big buddhist celebration the family come from all across the country and they'll all be in this temple sharing the special time and so the next day it was my 50th birthday and so i really was on top of the world because maria had planned a flight going back across the country, back towards Paro. And I could look down and see the road that we had driven, that Sonam and Wonchuk were driving to beat my plane. Um, it took them about eight hours. They set off the day before and they were driving across the country to meet me. And you could see how twisty the road was and how it's just dug into the mountainsides. And I was really honoured because on the plane there was a llama, a very special llama who was blessing everyone. And I felt not only the fact that it was my birthday, but also that he was he was on the plane. Um, and I just felt that was really lucky. And the skies were clear. It wasn't a bumpy flight. It wasn't a cloudy flight. So I had the most spectacular views. And just before we landed, he gave me this bracelet, which he blessed. So I was so honoured that I could have um, a gift from a llama. And I've worn this every day since. So this is very special. This is a little bit of Bhutan that comes everywhere with me. And when we landed, I was met by my guides and Sonam and Wonshuk, and I had missed them. We'd only been apart for 12 hours, but it was so lovely to meet them again. And they took me to a temple in Paro. And when we arrived, we could hear this singing and chanting and there was men singing on one side and then I could hear women. And I just said, oh, do you think we could go in and join the women singing? And Sonam said, oh, no, it's, you know, it's not allowed. You're not Buddhist. You're not, you know, you haven't been invited. But it turned out that my birthday in 2018 coincided with a very special women's festival. And that's why the women were all in a temple with a yogi and um, some monks and they were singing and chanting. So Sonam had disappeared and then he came back having pulled some strings and spoken to some people. And I got then invited to join these women. 
And so I spent an hour with them and we were chanting and singing and they were so lovely. They were they were giggling because I had no idea what they were singing. I didn't know what they were going to sing next. And they were banging drums and they had these trumpets that were bones. And here's a little video where you can hear some of the singing. <laughs> And these are the ladies. Um, afterwards, we got to go in the garden. So I was with them for about an hour and they were singing and there was different rhythms with the whole, um, the music or the, the celebration. And, um, and afterwards we were outside in the sunshine. So that was my birthday party. And for me, that was enough. I was so touched and it felt so magical to be there. And I had my eyes shut while the drums were beating and while the trumpets were were blowing and I felt like I was everywhere I'd ever been. I felt if ever you believed in past lives or future lives, I felt that I was in all of them at once and the drumming and the music, it was so soulful that I felt I could be anywhere. I could open my eyes and I could be in Mexico. I could be in Peru. I could be in Australia or I could be with the Maoris in New Zealand. It was just so powerful and really, really special. So for me, that was great. I thought, wow, what a way to spend my 50th. And then it got better because um, we then went to visit the Zong in Paro and there were these wild combs. So where the tourists were all going up the steps and looking around the Zongs, one shot was taking me around the side of the temple and we were craning our necks looking up at these abandoned bee combs. So these are wax combs and the bees had fled south for the summer and we could see them there. Now, what's incredible is because the monks believe that having anything to do with animals is a sin and eating honey is a sin, these wax combs become brittle and they break to the ground. And instead of using them to make candles, the wax is all just swept away and thrown in the bin. So I find that really interesting. And wouldn't it be great if there would be a way to talk with monks, um, to speak with monks and just say, how about recycling some of the wax and working with nature? So there's a, a bit more of a close up. So huge combs, absolutely huge. I mean, some of them will be a meter in depth hanging off these trees uh, off these sides of the building so all the wooden beautiful painted um, balconies coming out with these bees and this is from the distance and we could see them we actually saw some wasp nests hanging off there as well so they're just left to be these um, bee colonies are just left on the side of the temples and the bees come and go and they make their honey then they take their honey with them when they fly south for the the winter and here are the monks. And again, I could take hundreds of pictures of monks. I just think they're so beautiful and with the light in Bhutan and the colours. And there was these funny little signs. So the little sign above the central monk's head said, please do not ring or fiddle the bell. So whenever you travel around the world, it's always fun to see translations from the native language into your language. And I just like their use of, of words and fiddle was was quite a nice, nice word. And then we have these wonderful bridges that go across the rivers and um, with all the prayer flags. So the prayer flags are, have been printed by the monks. And the idea is that the wind blows the flags and carries the prayers along the wind to where they, they need to go. Now, while I was visiting the song, um, Sonam and Wanchuk kept swapping. So I would have Wanchuk with me for a while, then I'd have Sonam. And that night back at the hotel, um, or before the before dinner, Onchuk said, oh, why don't you come to the little lounge and have a cup of tea, which I hadn't done so far on the trip. So I said, oh, yeah, OK. When I went to this room, there was this cake and the two of them had organised this cake for me. So that, again, was really special. And all the staff from the hotel were there and we shared the cake with some other guests that were, were staying that night. And they lit a butter lamp for me, which is a huge honour to have a butter lamp and then they're put in this little box. So this was in the hotel temple. I had my very own special lamp. So really, really, really precious. So it did make celebrating 50 just perfect, absolutely perfect. So then our journey started again. So we needed to go to Timpu. So we were in Paro 
on the left hand side there and we had to take this road which was in the valley going along the river and going all the way to the capital city Timpu and um, then we went on from Timpu to Dochula and Dochula Pass is the highest point between Timpu and Punaka and they have all these chortons these are little prayer um boxes so they're they're very special buildings and you have giant ones and whenever there is somewhere that could have bad energy they put a chorten there and you always have to walk around the um clockwise around a chorten so if there's one on a mountain pass the cars have to drive around clockwise so it's like a little roundabout on top of a mountain and on the top of J Dochula, you have this cluster of 108 Chortons, which were put in memory of the military who died when they were fighting um, rebel forces down on the Indian border. And so this was really special because I have a son who's in the military. And um, so it was a really great place to be. But also I had listened to two books about Bhutan before I went and one was by a monk called an English lady a monk called Emma and a Buddhist monk and she had had her spiritual awakening when she was at Dochla and she'd met her her master she met a monk there a lama who then became her master and so it was really special for me to go to Dochla and particularly when we were on our way to Timpu and I got to meet her. So again, the joy of Facebook and um, social media, I was able to send her a message and say I'd read her book and I would love to meet her. And it just so happened she was in Bhutan. So we had dinner together and she told me about her projects for helping disabled children across Bhutan. And because I was disabled, um, and I certainly would not have been able to trek around Bhutan and travel if I hadn't got well, hadn't been recovered. It felt like just the right charity for me to support for my birthday. So I did a fundraiser and we actually raised some money for Bhutan. And it's just very special to think that there are children there who are now getting support from people in the UK and particularly children in very rural areas who don't have access to education, they don't have access to wheelchairs. And so she's doing a lot of work with schools and with communities, very rural communities to help those children. And that's why with my book, a pound from every copy goes to Opening Your Heart to Bhutan. So when you buy this book, you're actually helping Bhutan as well. So the more books we sell, the more we can help Bhutan. And if you click on the link, um, and put in free shipping when you order, you will actually get your book without having to pay shipping in the UK. So the next image, this is the story about the nun and the bees. So it was great because Emma is English, we were able to talk about spirituality and about the bees and how I couldn't understand why taking honey was a sin. And she was new to bees so she hadn't really thought about where bees could be involved with buddhism um, but she was aware that it it was considered a sin but she also talked about bee breath and how there was forms of breathing that are um, used in yoga she was also a yoga teacher and how the monks would use breath that was mimicking what they've learned from the bees and then she shared with me this um, poem or this chapter so the nun and the bees so imagine that you know that in a nearby cave or tree, there is a delicious store of honey, but it's surrounded by a swarm of angry bees. So that although you know the honey is there, you can't get to enjoy it. And then along comes an expert beekeeper who carefully takes away the bees and at last you can enjoy the honey. The Buddha is like such a beekeeper who skillfully helps everyone to remove all their buzzing, stinging anger and greed and unhelpful ideas so that they can enjoy at last the pure honey of perfect wisdom. So I love that I could find some connection between bees and Buddhism, but that was just the beginning. Now, as we're traveling around Punaka, and, um, and various other places, I would spot some native bees, quite difficult to photograph. And this is 
um, a native bee, but nobody knew what it was. And this is something I also find interesting about traveling is in the UK and, and in the West, perhaps we're very used to scientists and research and we're always trying to catalog everything. And in Bhutan, they haven't had that advantage. They haven't had the need, they haven't had the interest. And so between um, Timpu and Punaka, there are lots and lots of orchards, apple orchards, and um, but they don't use bees for pollination. So they must be using the native bees and solitary bees, but they haven't really done the research. There aren't people there counting the different species. So one of my worries was by introducing Apis mellifera, every time you add a colony of bees, you're adding 50,000 hungry mouths. So they're gonna be competing with the native and solitary bees. So I would love to go back and find out more about the different bees that are there. And you'll see behind me, I've got a poster and last year I was invited to do a poster presentation at Apimondia in Montreal, Canada about my bees in Bhutan and what I was learning. And what was fabulous, great opportunity to meet researchers and scientists from all around the world. And some of them had had tentative links with Bhutan and some had even stronger links. And so it was great to open that conversation about what's happening and what can we do um, as a bee community to learn more about what's happening in Bhutan because Bhutan is this very special country that hasn't been affected by the modern pollution the modern damages of society so wouldn't it be great if we can find what treasures they still have there and learn about them for our own well-being so then there was some more traveling and this was the great adventure I'd heard about the honey houses in Bhutan and I really wanted to go and see them. And Wonchuk and the, um, the beekeeping project managers in Bumthang had put us in touch with some beekeeping communities right down in the south in Surang. Now this was a big journey. It was about four and a half hours on Wigley Roads along a river where they're building a big dam. And then we went out off the roads. So the road finished, and um, we passed market stalls where they had local honey. And this is traditional bees kept in log hives. And this would be um, um, Apis serrana honey. So I was really excited and wanting to try the honeys. And there'd be these bridges. And we met this wonderful lady. We found this bridge and I wanted a picture of the bridge swinging across this raging river. And um, we saw this little speck coming towards us and gradually she got closer. And this lady was 86 years old and lives on the far side. So in the far side of the picture, she's her little cottage is there and she has no running water. So every day she walks across this bridge with her plastic containers and fills them up with water by these market stalls. So had a lovely little chat with her and learned a little bit about her story. And her husband was still alive, but he was in a hospital in, um, I think he was in Trongsa or Timpu um, for a, a condition. So she was living alone um, in this very, very remote part of the world. And so we drove through these great mountains and these little communities. And what the King of Bhutan has done is he's given every family in Bhutan four acres of land so that they can be self-sufficient. And what a lot of the people have done is moved into this southern part of Bhutan where you've got subtropical weather um, and yet you've still got the beautiful mountains and you've got the rivers. So you have a mixture of Bhutanese from all over Bhutan um, from the north, south, east and west, coming together, making their little farmsteads. And you can see these narrow roads with the um, great big rocks. So the road has been cut through in the rock and there'll be prayer flags draped across just to make your journey a little bit safer when you're, um, when you're driving along. And then this is the end of the road. So the road ended here and we met this government official who was in charge of conservation in this area. And he took us along a walk through the jungle, through cardamom and citrus orchards to um, a honey house. And if we'd had another few hours, we could have driven along dirt tracks and we would have got to a whole village. But that's saved for another time. So here we are walking through.
So no road, just a little track. And you can hear the birds. And me chattering, asking questions all the way. And we came to this beautiful house and then there was a house next to it. And you may be able to see these boxes. Well, these are beehives. So these are log hives and long boxes that are positioned around a house. So a house could have six to um, 10 hives sometimes around the house. But the really special thing is, so there's a log hive hanging up, is that they have beehives built in the walls of their houses, which is just amazing and particularly in the UK it would make a lot of sense because the hives are always kept at a certain temperature the bees like to have a warm temperature so why not have bees in as insulation for your house and this picture I also love because the bees these are Apis serrano they're living in the walls of the house with this family notice they've got no bee suits on and this is their front door into their house and the bees are flying past the door now this connected with um, a story I heard from a historian in Britain about bees and how they found that from reading old wills where people would will their beehives and after doing a bit of research and, and putting things together they discovered that people in the UK would put beehives along their um, driveway their path to their front door and sometimes would have bee bowls so holes in the walls above their front doors so that in the winter they would put their skep their straw basket of bees above their door so that the bees can um can actually come and go but also so the bees know the beekeeper so then you are living together and then you share, you compare that with the fact that in these days, bees are not brought into the homes or into our gardens. They tend to be left out in apiaries all year round. And beekeepers, conventional beekeepers, rarely visit their bees through the winter. They will leave them be. And what I find a very interesting statistic is that the highest number of bee stings is in April and it is to beekeepers. And it's when the beekeepers do their first inspections in the spring. So obviously the bees are a bit shocked thinking, who on earth are you? You've just come and you're putting your hands into my hive. So I'm a bit threatened. So I'm going to sting you. So if you live with your bees or you visit your bees regular, regularly, which is what I do with, with my bees or any bees that I look after for people, is we make sure we continue a relationship with the bees throughout the year. And that's what this family do is they live with their bees. So this family have up to 12 hives around the house, either in logs or in holes in the walls. And they will just take a few combs out throughout the year. So they'll do two harvests, one in May, June and one in the um, autumn and they would only get about two kilograms of honey per colony per year. So um, a conventional hive in the UK sometimes would be, um, well, an average would be 10 kilos per hive, and quite often it could be 70 kilos. So if you've got a really productive hive, and particularly a year like this year. So you have this um, a sustainable way of keeping bees. And I was very, very lucky because he shared um, some of his honey with me and popped it in a pot of, um, now this has actually sadly slightly fermented because it's a high, um, high water content. And the smell, it still smells, it doesn't smell like a fermented honey. It still smells as it did when I first tried it. And this is a citrus and cardamom honey. So again, if I was visiting you all um, in a hall and you were all here at the talk, I would pass this round and you'd get to have a taste. Mm. Oh gosh, it's so fruity. You could, <coughs> you can taste the citrus. <coughs> gosh. It just explodes. It explodes in your mouth with flavour. So the cardamom, the lemons, the oranges. Oh, heavenly. <laughs> but if you do get to try it, have a glass of water nearby. And I don't know if you could see the colour. It's almost the colour of mustard. Now, this honey would not win any competitions. I'm a honey judge. 
and um, because it's got bits in it, but this has got brood in it. I mean, they literally just take out a piece of comb and whatever's in the comb gets pressed and made into the honey and put in these plastic bottles. So it has a distinctive flavor. It'll be a bit more waxy than you would perhaps be familiar with with a honey, but amazing, amazing. And the really special thing for me was I felt quite guilty about this trip um, that we had driven four and a half hours to find this beehive. And actually, I've got a little bit of a video to show you the bees flying so you can see them um, flying in front of the, the door of the house. But um, Sonam, you know, he had to do this driving and we it was just a, a very, very, very long drive on mountain roads and then on tracks. So it was very difficult to to get there. And um, after the um, here we go. So you can see the bees flying quite busy and they were like this when the family was stood in front of them. And you can hear lovely, happy people. Lots of giggling, wondering why this mad white woman wanted to look at their bees that they just take for normal. They just live with their bees. And so this is another little video that shows them close up. And so this is Apis Serana living in the walls of a house. So turn your volume up if you want to listen to um, bees buzzing. So there we go. And let me just try and get the next picture. So what really amazed me was that Sonam, who... Um, had done all the driving at the end of our trip I thought he would be saying um, that he he never wanted to um, do a trip like that or it, it took too long or it was just too upsetting for him to have to do such a drive and that I really was the challenge for him and um, he actually said at the end of the trip that um, it was his best absolutely best day of the whole time with me and even though he was having to drive roads like this and what was amazing is the potential for road rage and there was no road rage when we'd see this when we would turn around a bend and be faced with a big truck like this jingling away with all its bells um, and with people on the road and monkeys everyone would just giggle and go breathe in and somehow we would squeeze past these trucks but Sonam said that his trip down to see the honey house was life changing and he had no idea, even though he was Bhutanese, lived in Bhutan all his life, he'd never been to this part of Bhutan. And the thought of having this ideal life on this mountainside with his young children and to see this man with his family living amongst orchards where it's more of a bartering society, people are, are looking after each other and it certainly looked like heaven on earth. So tasting the honey reminds me of my my time there. And here we go. We had lunch then um, just before we headed back for our long journey back. And we went, we stopped at a little hotel and they put together some food for us. And um, we were right in the south of Bhutan. Uh, so you can see from the signs, it said Dampu and um, Sarang. So we were near the border of India and we were watching Bear Grylls on the television. So extraordinary that you would have this huge TV screen. So you'd think that Sonam and Wonshuk are looking at me, but I had to really wave my hands around because they were more interested in Bear Grylls, who was just behind me on the TV screen. So on the way back, I was able to meditate again. I was um, at Dotchula. There are again um, a series where the 108 Chortons were. There is a group of um, I can't remember now if it's 12 or 13, but little meditation caves. And so you're able to sit in these caves and meditate. So I was left alone there to meditate. And my view was looking out like the view you saw earlier with all the Himalayas in the background, the highest peaks of Bhutan. So really, really special. And the um, 
the guru behind me is actually the one for um, energy, which I felt was very appropriate because before I was um, well again, one of the things I really lacked was energy. And here I was at 50 years old, full of energy on top of the world, meditating and just loving life and glad to be there. And so I got to cross these prayer bridges. So this is the iron bridge between um, Timpu and Paru, Paro. And there you actually have all the prayer flags and just amazing. There's so much history there. And now this is the scariest road in Bhutan. Just when I thought I'd got used to the roads, this one is the road up for the beginning of the trek, the Bumdrak trek, which we went at the end. Um, to come down to the tiger's nest and this was so scary but the view you could look down and can you see that is the airport that is Paro airstrip so you get an idea now of when I flew in from India we flew in like that came along the valley and then he turned around so we could look at um, tiger's nest and then had to sort of twist around these mountains and then land in that little strip and while we were doing the trek, you would hear a plane. And so everyone would stop and just watch the plane and watch them land. And we trekked high up, um, well over 4,000 metres. And there was a little um, temple built in, again, with angel hairs and a bit of magic on the side of this cliff. And you can just see the little green tents there. That was what we slept in. It was a luxury camp, absolutely fabulous. And... Um, Wonchuk and I climbed up to see this monk and we were um, chatting to him and he was on his phone, on his mobile phone. So they all have mobile phones. And again, there was the sound of chimes and we were high up in the mountains. Just so, so special. And then as we came down, any excuse to to um, make things well, put good energy. And so chimes are very magical and where water is flowing, this the water is creating enough energy to spin the bell so it chimes. So as you walk down, and this is pure mountain water that you can just drink. And because it's been blessed by the bells, it's even better for you. So this is high, high, high above the um, Tiger's Nest Temple. And then we found a big clump of ivy, and that was full of a mixture of bees. So there was Apis dorsata, there was Apis serrano, and there was Apis mellifera, all feeding off the autumn ivy. And then here I am just before the tiger's nest. And um, this is a very magical place, which was completely burnt to the ground and then rebuilt as it's um, as close to the original as it could be. And fully restored and from this point here there are about a thousand steps down and another thousand up to get to the the actual temple so it's quite a trek and the hill behind me that was what we had trekked along that whole top to then drop down to this temple so that is just a taster of what I experienced in Bhutan so this was my my adventure of the bees in Bhutan. There is so much to say about it all. And if you'd like to um, learn more, then you need to see the book. And um, let me just see if I can. So you can buy the book from this link and then you'll see a lot more photographs and you can learn more about um, my trip to Bhutan and about the spiritual aspects. And there was one final thing that I wanted to add that I didn't realize until I came to be writing my book. And I had my little notebook that I'd carried around with me that my friend Sally had given to me. Um, and so I'd taken notes as we'd gone through. And when Sonam had told me about how it was a sin to take honey, I was um, I was so shocked and I spent most of my time there trying to figure out why anybody would think that honey would be a sin when so many other religions talk about honey being medicine. And even um, Damcho had said that they use honey in some of their medicine. And what amazed me was when I was looking back through my notebook, I found that after he had told me it was a sin, 
he'd also told me that Buddhist monks believe that the highest level of reincarnation is as a bee. And so that is why it was a sin to eat the honey, because their lamas, their gurus would have reincarnated as a bee. And therefore, by eating their honey, they're eating the products of their own kind, of their own monks. And so that's why they don't take honey. And as I learned more about Bhutan and as I wrote about it and as I was looking through my thousands, I did take thousands of photographs, I began to realize that the whole country is a really spiritual country and that the Bhutanese are on a different level to us. And so maybe they don't need to eat the honey because they don't need the healing that we all need from the honey. So by having the the experience and of seeing how these bees are happy and spiritual and healthy and they're not having the 30 to 40 percent losses every winter that we have they'll have one to two percent and that will be due to a bear it's not due to disease it's not due to um the pesticides or the fungicides or all the damage that we do to our land that is feeding the bees so i find it just fascinating that I had gone there not knowing what I was going to learn, what I was going to experiment, uh, experience while I was there. And in turn, I learned so much and there's so much more to learn about Bhutan, not just for me and about the bees, but for us all. So thank you very much. Um, I really hope that you've enjoyed this. I hope it's given you a taste of Bhutan and perhaps if you are able to travel there, it's somewhere that you would travel, leaving no trace, leaving just your footprints and learning about what a special place this is and bringing back some of Bhutan to our world so that we can live as in harmony as the Bhutanese do with their landscape. So thank you very much. Um, do put comments in and I will go back and I will answer any questions. And, um, you know, don't forget, get the book. And if you want it signed for anybody, just send me a message. And I look forward to seeing you all for my next webinar. So just keep subscribing and you'll be getting newsletters. You'll get information about when I'm doing webinars. Join me on Facebook. You can watch me on Instagram um, where I'll be sharing pictures and hopefully eventually you'll be able to see me live when we're all allowed out and we can visit each other again. So thank you very much and I hope you've enjoyed it and I'll see you all again soon. And what fitting way to end than with a little bit of Bhutan. <laughs>